Obviously, the business of books is something we care about a great deal here in the libraries. And judging from the turnout and level of interest we've had in this talk, it's something that you care about, too. Before we get started, I want to say just a quick thank you to our co-sponsors, Duke University Communications, the Publishing Humanities in Initiative of the Franklin Humanities Institute, the Duke Faculty Write Program, and of course, Duke University Press. I also want to thank Allison Jones and Duke University Communications, who's a longtime friend of Julia's. <coughs> Allison is the one who told us that Julia would be visiting the Triangle area and proposed the idea of hosting a conversation between her and Dean. So we have her to thank for this opportunity of hearing from them. After the conversation, we'll have about 15 minutes of time for question and answer. And that's all the housekeeping items. I just want to say my final thank you to Ed Allison, Vice Provost for Interdisciplinary Studies and Professor of History a very good friend of the libraries, who agreed to be our moderator for this conversation. Ed will introduce our speakers and start things off. Thank you all for coming. Thanks so much, Deborah. So I'm, I'm uh, so pleased uh, to be here today with, uh, with Julia and Dean. Let me just start off by giving you a, a sense of, of, uh, of their accomplishments. Uh, Julia A. Reedhead is president of W.W. W. Norton and Company, the nation's oldest and largest publishing house owned wholly by its employees. She began her career there as a traveling college sales rep before embarking on an editorial path, taking on responsibility for the legendary Norton Anthologies, read by more than 50 million students worldwide. From 1990 to 2016, she edited the flagship, um, well, several flagship uh, anthologies, the anthology of Norton, uh, the Norton Anthology of English Literature, the Norton Anthology of American Literature, the Norton Anthology of Poetry, and the Norton Anthology of Literature by Women, just uh, among uh, a couple of examples among many. Uh, Reed had also guided the editorial process for the publication of uh, Seamus Heaney's translation of Beowulf, Commission for the Norton Anthology of English Literature. In addition to her work at Norton, Reedhead chairs the Board of Governors of Yale University Press. And uh, she also holds a BA in Comparative Literature from Yale. Uh, Dean Smith is, is director of Duke University Press. Uh, during, during his more than 30 years in publishing, he has had extensive uh, experience with the creation of digital platforms, business development and acquisition, open access publishing, and global sales and marketing. His content area responsibilities have ranged from the humanities uh, to the social sciences and STEM fields, with occasional forays into the world of sports. <laughs> Prior to coming to Duke, he was the director of Cornell University Press, overseeing a program that publishes 150 new books a year uh, and featuring uh, 3,400 e-books. A, a published author, poet, and freelance journalist. Uh, he also teaches as an adjunct professor of publishing in the Master's in Professional Studies program at George Washington University. Uh, one of his all-time favorite moments, I'm told, was doing a public conversation with John Cleese. <laughs> I haven't seen the video, but I have, so I don't know whether there are any silly walks. Uh, but I have heard the audio, and I can tell you that Dean is an amazing straight man. That's great. That's really fun. So, uh, so let's get going. Um, so the two of you occupy different domains of the publishing world. Uh, on one hand, a leading academic press. On the other, a highly regarded trade publishing house. Uh, so to start, as you each think about the niche within the public publishing ecosystem occupied by the other, what features make you most envious? <laughs> <laughs> Michael Lewis. <laughs> mm. All right, you answered that one already? <laughs> Well, <clears throat> it's interesting because, you know, the recent years there are authors that are coming to university presses because they've quote unquote washed out of the trade and or, or they're coming to look for a way to have their idea be, be translatable or, or to cross over into trade and a lot. So 
a lot of the things that we're doing are looking for in every season, what books have that chance? You know, what books have that chance to catch on, not maybe to the level of a big five trade house, but, and, and some of the times we get into that Monty Python pet shop thing where we're trying to put a dorsal fin on a cat, you know, and it's, <laughs> that's basically not a good thing for us to be doing. But everyone still has that aspirational idea of, you know, we, we joke, there are a lot of gallows humor that goes on, you know, 1,000 copies sold is, you know, 1,000 is the new 5,000. You know, that, that's a successful book for University Press. And when we look out and we think of the coverage and the kind of brand of something like Norton, you know, they can, they're, they're, they're global, they're, um, you know, that's just, and, but, but we're, we're good at, at, you know, the thing is for us to be good at what we do, and that is, make sure you know we're, we're keeping the fundamentals we're doing solid editing what we can bring to it is careful editing a lot of thoughtful marketing different talented folks some of whom are right here uh, that that are engaged and passionate about what we're doing i think about uh that parrot on the television uh, in Monty Python who's pining for the fjords, the, stu <laughs> the, the stuffed bird. He's not dead, he's pining for the fjord. Um, I pine sometimes as uh, when I in involvement with the university presses for the, the, um, the P&L, the profit and loss statement that drives a lot of the decisions in commercial publishing requires us to show that we can make, we can make a profit. We can stay in business as a commercial company. And um, I know the economics of university press publishing are very challenging, but there can be other motives that drive a publication for a book that are about an intellectual mission or joining a conversation. And I sometimes do envy, um, envy that, that mission, that room to do something like that. The, so it's interesting because I really view my role as a business development person and, and <coughs> you know, there were university presses for you know, 20, 30 years when library budgets were good. There was an isolationist perspective where, you know, we don't necessarily need the, the host university or we want to try to publish our way out of these things. And that is exactly today and in, at this moment the wrong way to go. Um, we're basically trying to break even, you know, that's it, you know, and I'm looking for those uh, things that'll allow us to do that, whether it's partnerships with the library or partnerships with the folks over in Chapel Hill at Longleaf or other different ways to really streamline what it is we're doing so that we can get to market in a just-in-time way. One of the things I noticed about University Presses was that this idea of just-in-time or even digital first is almost a new concept, you know, how do you how do you present, uh, to you know, provide uh, a Sadia Hartman book to someone in Australia today, right now? That's the kind of thing that I'm thinking about, and thinking about, you know, when libraries, when Amazon, when everybody else in the ecosystem is just in time, how can we innovate as a university press? And that's the big opportunity we have. We're within a university. Where, you know, I look out and I see, you know, the tremendous talent, and intellectual capital that can come to bear on what it is we're doing. You know, the things. It, so it's very exciting for me to be here. So, so the two of you together have gone to uh, already to the most obvious difference between trade publishers and academic presses, right? Which is that trade houses have an obligation to turn a profit, while the academic publisher uh, tends to emphasize the imperative to disseminate knowledge, <coughs> understanding that there's still a, a, a financial constraint. And you uh, already have, have have dug into the most obvious area where this involves differences, which is title acquisition. But I, I was intrigued, um, I was intrigued, Dean, that you also started talking about other elements of, of the publishing process. So I wonder if it would be worth spending a little bit of time to talk about how uh, editing, design, marketing is different between the two. If, if it is different, yeah. maybe, it, maybe it isn't. You know, uh, I want to, the, the profit imperative is, it's somewhat different at Norton, I should say, because we own ourselves. When you have outside shareholders uh, who expect a quarterly dividend, your publishing decisions are very different from when you can play a long game and decide how you want to publish, on what time frame, and 
who, you know, what you want to be in the world as a business and the people who work there, their experience of publishing and the, and the kinds of books you put out in the world. So I'll speak to the, that's a little bit of an oblique entrance to your question there, Ed, but here, editing at Norton is, is still part, we expect to edit our books and we have retained the staff, we keep the staff that enables us to edit it to the standards we want to present to the world. One of the, <laughs> one of the, the publicly traded companies' uh, behaviors in recent years is outsourcing an enormous amount of the traditional publishing process. Um, it's you know traditional enough to outsource cover design, say, or um, pr um, file creation, you know, page layout. But to outsource the editorial decision making is a whole different order of hands off. We've kept all of that very close, circled our wagons. We're not, we're not big enough to be a company that just, you know, muscles our way through um, each season's list. You know, whatever lives lives, what dies dies. You can't. You know, it's you have to be more cur curated in a smaller company that we are. So the editing and publicity efforts are are very carefully considered when you're spending your own dime. And it's title driven. It's, it's not one size fits all. I think we still retain those traditional publishing values. And I would agree with that. Um, there's many great stories. When, when I was at Cornell, the uh, dean of the ILR school I met with and, and he said, you know, I, I published my book with X, but it would have been a better book had it been done by Cornell. Because of the ideas that we were putting forward at the beginning before it went somewhere else and there was a larger advance involved. But, you know, I think editing is a core competitive advantage and, and that's, you know, every month you're getting testimonials from folks saying how much they love that process. That's not something you want to think about outsourcing, you know, and um, the, the idea, so at Duke University Press, we're really fortunate to have folks that have been there and who, where, the, where you talk about the chemistry on the publicity and marketing and even the publishing side, where you have uh, Michael McCullough, who, who started at Columbia Sales, you know, Columbia in the late 80s, and I worked there as well, and, and Laura Sell, who's here, you know, that, that kind of chemistry of, of actually knowing the books and knowing what to do with the books. That kind of continuity is something you want to keep intact. And, and also, that stretches over to our acquisition. So Ken also was a fellow traveler, Ken Whisaker. And he started as Princeton sales rep. And by the way, some of the great, the greatest people in publishing started as, as, as you know, either at Prentice Hall or at uh, other other publishers to as sales reps. So that there's a chemistry that you do not, you really want to foster and facilitate and make sure that that stays intact. Because sometimes when directors change, and I just started in June, you you'll see folks begin to, marketing directors leave, or they'll be going through different things. And this, this whole thing that works, the, the ability to build those communities is what is successful, those networks of authors, editors, reviewers, book buyers, all of that, it's one, it's one group that, that continues to grow, so. So there are many currents of change reshaping book publishing. Let me just list a few. <coughs> the rise of Amazon as a dominant distribution channel. The growth of audio and ebooks, declining library pur purchases of particularly print academic monographs, the role of social media as a promotional avenue, the waxing importance of markets in Asia. Which of these trends do you see as most important for your press, either because of the challenges they pose, they keep you up at night, uh, or the opportunities they present? And what other trends should we be paying attention to? Yeah, I'll just jump right in with this one. <laughs> um, the things that keep me up at night, oh, do you have the time? We, uh, I look at the, we'll use the shorthand, the rise of Amazon, but basically it's, a cons it's the tremendous consolidation of channels of distribution that are, is occurring in, on the trade side. Um, you, you have Amazon, you have Barnes & Noble working hard under its new leader, James Daunt, to turn itself around. Um, you have Follett's 
uh, which is a distribution channel. Uh, you had Baker and Taylor, but they got out of the retail business. And then you had the Indies. And the Indies bookstores, like Flyleaf, like Regulator, comprise about 10, 11% of the entire marketplace. Now, they punch above their weight. They can make a book. They are <coughs> book people who talk to their customers and get them to try new things. They are, w we are, we link arms with them. We love the Indies uh, at Norton, since our list is so much uh, of interest, so often of interest to them. Um, but the consolidation of business into channels that are, w in the case of Amazon, that are driven by algorithms, it, it makes it very difficult for a reader to discover a new book. A new book that maybe hasn't had the benefit of popping to the top, let's say, of you know, Michelle Obama's Becoming or other books that are, you know, they take up a, a disproportionate amount of the, the space and they sell and that's why Amazon puts them at the top of the list. So you've got, you've got this narrowing of the, the varieties of channels for publishers like us, and I'm, I do put us together with the UPs in this respect, who publish a wide range of books that fall into this, that have readers and they have merit, but they don't have, they're not going to pop to the best of that, to the top of those lists. That is the thing that keeps me up at night. <laughs> Your turn. <laughs> so, so I would, you know, I would, I would agree with all of that. And then you throw in, we also publish journals so you, and open access and plan S and different funding models around the world that are, that we will really need to, to deal with and, and in some way comply with. And those pressures in terms of, for open access, we're looking for subventions from most of the institutions where the authors are, are publishing with us. And if we're getting a certain amount, we can offer that book as an open access title, which is really great because we can have that book through JSTOR or Project Muse be in 205 countries. And that is something that helps Duke <coughs> Press, but also the university in terms of getting that brand out into the world. But <coughs> I don't see it as viable for the humanities long term. I don't think there's enough money in the system that's going to be, you know, we'll be able to make that sustainable. I, uh, I will admit, uh, I spend a lot of time looking in Vendor Central about what's going on with the metadata in Amazon because something goes wrong there. These are on, it's under the theme of the things we can't control, mm -hmm. which there are numbers of those things. You know, mm -hmm. we just got hit recently with about a $90,000 return from Ingram. You know, that's something, you know, the, which is why I love ebooks because, and I love selling ebooks and as many as possible to libraries because they don't get returned. You know, when I arrived, my marketing director, <laughs> my marketing director at Duke said, they don't get returned. I said, they don't get returned. You're, you're the, you're great, you know, I'm glad I'm here. Yeah. But, uh, and, and it's interesting because that's where the book's being accessed by chapter. It's being used for research. It's a whole different, I think, ecosystem than what's going on with, you know, that reading experience. It's, it's, there's much more utility. A search engine, a library search engine will bring back a list of results that you may or may not even know what publisher it is, but um, trying to make sure that we are optimized there. And uh, discoverability, metadata, like metadata is the new direct mail, it's the new space ads, it's the new, and early, as early as possible. So a lot of the big five trade houses, they're they're nine months to almost a year, maybe not a year, but nine months out there with those books. We're, we're season to season, so it's about six, four to six months for us in advance in terms of the metadata. But if something is out of line, that feed's not going right, you could, you, you know, that could have a catastrophic effect. And I am also kept up at night <laughs> by what, Amazon is no, no respecter of territories. But publishing is, uh, a business where there are rights territories of, across the the globe, and you know, you we buy a book, we hope to publish it in world English. But uh, the thing about the internet is, you can you it's a it's a race to the bottom. You find the cheapest book, and you your Prime membership lets you ship it for free, and so there's a whole it's a, it's a massively disruptive possibility that that rights territories and it you know markets people price to market, so there's a lot of that kind of uh, behavior that's going to change the way we do business as well. I do like the fact that ebooks aren't returnable though. <laughs> <laughs> so publishing, like many professions linked to knowledge creation, uh, continues to be a field 
sorely in need of more demographic diversity. What should publishers be doing to foster more diverse workforces? Mm. Oh, this is this really is a a, um, a big challenge that we are very consciously working to address. We are located in New York, and there is happily um, a, there are many many schools where students express interest in the book business, and we have a robust internship program, and we end up hiring a good number of those interns. That's been the, I would say that's been the most effective channel, but it is a person at a time. It is very difficult to, um, to, to satisfactorily change the face of the entire company, I mean to my satisfaction, so that's, that's a work in progress. And I'm really fortunate to be at a press where a number of these issues are, are, are in open dialogue every month and today is it, the equity and inclusion group meets and, and mostly averages about 70 out of 120 employees attend this. And there's constant brainstorming about how can we, we uh, receive some diversity fellowships through the AUP, the Association of University Pr Presses. I think more work needs to be done and, and what I mean is that I think we need to commit to not only expanding the numbers, and, but also training. So could we play a role in actually developing a uh, publishing school uh, with NCCU or some other you know, schools and, and trying to increase, the, it's about you know, anything, even it's about pipeline and expanding the pools in our recruitment and doing, but I think it's critically important for us because it's all about walking the walk. You know, we publish books uh, from marginalized voices. We publish a lot of, of, of people of color and, that, and, and those issues and, and, and diverse, diversity issues. So we need that internally as well. That needs to be a core, core value of what we do at the press and it's a huge, I think, opportunity for us. What I want us to do is take a leadership role in that. So. And I think there's, uh, it might be worth having you reflect as well a little bit on not just um, strategies to bring people in, but also strategies to retain right. and provide professional development as well. Any thoughts there? So we, uh, and, and again, you know, the staff that, that's involved with this are, are very creative. So we've just come up with a, a, a mentoring program and, and affinity groups and, and uh, set aside money so that folks can go have coffees, you know, to talk about, you know, the, those kinds of things. So it's it's institutionalized now, and that's um, it's you know, th and that's part of the commitment that I want to bring is that we, you know we really need this is a long term thing. You know, this is 400 years, uh, so we we need to just make incremental and positive change as we can. I agree uh, strongly with the mentoring uh, the mentoring commitment, and I think I mean I personally do it. I want people to know that I see them and I am, I am watching their development and it matters to me personally. I, I, um, I mean, we're small enough that, 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 that actually can work. But it's also having people feel like they can, anywhere on the, on the hall, they can talk to someone, get their questions answered, um, and, and expect encouragement and community. So that's, that's also the culture, you know, you try to model that when you're, when you're um, in a job that people look to for signaling about how, how, what do we think of this issue? Well, you know, I'm going to show you what I think and you're going you're gonna to think that too, hopefully. <laughs> so so one, one area that I thought might be useful um, to explore involves, you know, where would the authors just get things wrong? <laughs> so, oh, well, we want to answer that one, Dean. <laughs> <laughs> so, I, I, I just, I, so I invite you to reflect a little bit on what you've seen as the most common misconceptions that people who wish to be authors have about book publishing, especially book, public, book publishing now as it's under such rapid change. It used to be, how, how can you get my book on Oprah? You know, that's what it used to, but now it's, I think it's trying to calibrate those expectations up front and, and I think it starts somewhat with the author in terms of what is it you're trying to accomplish? Is this a tenure book? Is this 
um, something that you want to have broad appeal. Uh, you know, there's, there's a mix that we're committed to for every book in terms of publicity, editing. A lot of times we quibble over cover designs, and I'm al I always laugh th internally, not externally, but I <laughs> laugh <coughs> about what we become so concerned over things that no longer matter. You know, that's the thing, is there are, but, but providing good service to the authors, providing, that's definitely something that matters in terms of that it's still all about relationships and it's managing those expectations because if you, you'll get a sense right away in working with an author how it's going to go. And you want to upfront basically try to figure out what's most important. What are you doing? What are you doing the book? What, what's this book going to? I published a book about the Baltimore Ravens. The reason I did so was because my grandparents went 12 years without a football team and I wanted to give them a gift. So at the, from the, after that point, I didn't really care what happened. And <laughs> things, things are going to happen that you have no idea. This book's going to get picked up by somebody and you're going to get a letter that tells you how much that meant to them. And that's going to be the most important positive experience that you've had with the book. So what you're bringing to it is maybe your colleague's experience or maybe somebody else's experience or the seven people that told you this color scheme on your cover isn't going to work. But I can respond to say, my designers have been doing this. Some worked at the trade, Henry Holt, and other places. So I'm a lot of times in these conversations saying, you got to trust the professionals here. You're, the, you know, you're bringing the ideas. This is a marketplace of ideas. But the professionals know what they're doing, too. I think that, that, the, the, uh, that authors would do well to understand that it is about fit. The publishers are, are very distinctive in their cultures. Uh, I mean, there are different types of publishing, like you know, the university press world and the commercial world, but there are commercial publishers like us who are, we kind of straddle these worlds. We have very serious lists in nonfiction. We have, um, you know, uh, we have areas that are kind of where the Norton lives. And to understand that each publisher, or in the case of the big five, you know, you have imprints within the house, so that you need to understand where, you know, where your book belongs and not necessarily assume that, I mean, it's, you know, the world of advances in the trade world, uh, in trade is, is lunatic, you know, how certain kinds of contests heat up and the money goes crazy. And, you know, we, we try to be grown-ups and say, this is, this is never, <laughs> never going to make any money. We've stopped here. Thank you very much. But we are probably the, we are the best place for your book. And why can we say that? Because we understand your book and we know how to publish your book. And we've published other kinds of books like this and done extremely well with them. We are the best place. But maybe we're not the biggest check. So that's the kind of thing that, that in my world is sometimes what I wish authors understood. Of course, agents have a different point of view, you know. <laughs> so the swirling debates about open access maybe focus more on journals than books, but there is a book angle to it. Now, I wonder what your thoughts are about where we are with open access for books, how that relates to libraries, um, whether, whether we have a good understanding of the dynamics with open ac access and how it relates to other, you know, even the possibility of print books. Uh, the, the print version, actually, uh, what it will do if you, it's an open access book to the, the, other, the other channel. So uh, open access, I think where we are right now is that authors need to be educated more about what it is. And that, you know, there's still perceptions out there that it's a digital book, so I may not get tenure. Or it may not be peer reviewed as well because it's open access. but. You know, one of the interesting things is that the narrowest, the narrowest of monographs, if it's published OA, will have far more, a far wider distribution than any, what we would even call a trade book at, at Duke University Press. It would be, y y your book would only have a North American footprint, some Western Europe, but an open access book would be around and all over the world through its discoverability. The JSTOR platform for open access, the most powerful one, the results come for those books right under Google. So people are finding that content. And that's kind of really important in terms of delivering 
the knowledge to the world. That's really what you know, presses back in even 1869, the first were started, but it was all about dissemination. It still is, but you actually can, and even partnering with libraries, be able to do these kinds of things. And, and I think libraries are playing a role with publishers to help with the funding on that. And I can't say enough about it because, again, it's that motivation of what, what are you trying to do? Because, you know, there is somebody somewhere that will benefit from that. My, uh, in my world, the analog to open access in the uh, journals and, and university, you know, scholarly materials is the open educational resource movement within the college publishing world where there is, um, there are in many states initiatives to make sure that students' course materials are cost nothing. Um, some states are mandating they need to be low cost, and low cost is typically defined as uh, under forty dollars. So that environment, and there have been a lot of grants provided um, by you know Gates is on the Gates Foundation has underwritten a lot of this. I know there are others where they provide a one-time grant for instructors to create course materials. From the point of view of the publisher of college uh, textbooks. The open educational resource movement is, you know, you can, we can't compete with free if, if it's all about the price. So our response to that, uh, I've tried to encourage our uh, salespeople to understand how to talk about the editorial development, how to talk about authoring and editorial development and the uh, universe of materials that go into creating good courseware, good whether it be digital or print or both. In our case, we are agnostic. We're happy to have you buy a print book if you want it, or <laughs> we'll sell you an e-book if you want it. But there's value there. So it's, it's emphasizing the value proposition, but then it's also emphasizing that these are, your student's success in their course is really the, it's the end game here. You want to teach a course where your students succeed. And that is, that has, that's measurable now, you know, you can, you, we collect the metrics and you have them and you can see and the, and the administration can look at how many students make it through Psych 101. I went yesterday to see the amazing Psych 101 lecture on personality by Bridget Martin Hart using our materials. So that was, that was an instance where I know what we've created is vastly better than what you can harvest from the internet. I know that. So it's getting the word out that zero, that free isn't really free and that fair pricing is worth your student's success. So that's my mission in response to free, but it's somewhat different from what, you, what Dean is up yes, against. I love that, by the way, what, what you just said. Oh. Um, <laughs> the, uh, the, the idea that, you know, there's, so one of the interesting things is in not all university press is really interested in open access. Not, you know, I would say there are 10, maybe out of 125 or 15. Um, there's still on the university press side the fear that these books will not be sold in print. And I think that that, there are a number of cases now that show that if you do it right and make them discoverable, that experience with a PDF on the screen is never going to be as good as the codex, never going to be, and it will help the print sales. So, and, and I think it's a different audience that's using the PDF versus the person that would buy the print. So I'm, I'm you know, encouraged by that and will continue to try and monitor that. So what advice would you give someone interested in getting into publishing? say just out of college or thinking about a career change or perhaps in graduate school and intrigued by publishing as an avenue. What experiences would you recommend that they try and uh, gain? What are, the, what are the right entry points? So as a publishing instructor at GW, what I talk about is presentation skills because I'm looking for folks that are not just going to be in the entry level but are going to go on from there. So oral, written, being able to present, being able to project manage, have some sense or facility with technology, but be able to present your ideas clearly because that's how you're going to 
be able to move up in the profession. So, and, but, but, but definitely just a range of skills. And you sort of see it with communications folks too. It's not just about writing the articles. It's coding. It's the website. It's all of these other things that are going to help make that content be discoverable outside. And you've got to have, and, and the facility with which um, some of the folks coming in, you know, the, the, the talents, whether it be design or web or all of those, um, you know, it's, it's kind of amazing what, you know, the folks that we have already, so. Oh, that's very good advice. I, I think that we are one of the wonderful uh, places where I get the word out as far as I can, English majors, please come here. <laughs> uh, I'm absolutely serious, a humanistic background is, is just perfect set up for understanding why book publishing is an interesting line of work. We're, I mean, they're readers and we're writers. You know, this is what we did and it's valuable. And it, it, it's valuable as to open the door. Like, I mean, I interview a lot of new graduates, most of them humanities grads, um, who are interested in an entry level job and they don't know what that means. So that's one of the pieces of advice I would give is to you know, do your homework to understand the range of entry level jobs that are, um, available in the publishing world. And don't feel like s dipping your toe in one area means you will never be able to do something else. So many people want, I wanted to be an editor when I knocked, knocked on the door at Norton. And um, I started in sales. And that was how I got my editorial uh, toehold. So, uh, so do your homework, learn the range of, of positions. I'll tell you one anecdote, which is a Duke anecdote because um, we have a, f a friend in common, I think. My mentor at Yale was Dick Broadhead. And uh, when I, um, he advised my senior thesis, and he's the person I, I almost went on to get my PhD in comp lit, and he said, well, why don't you go, you know how he's, whoa, going out into, the, <laughs> out into the world and do something else and see if you feel called, called back. And I got a job as a sales rep at Norton and then ultimately ended up editing literature books. And he said, well, you have the job every English major in America would like to have. You know, why would you? Um, but it was that advice that was invaluable to me in saying, OK, I can, you know, I'll go out there and try this new thing that's so foreign. To, I, I was a comp lit major. What am I doing knocking on doors selling you know, comp computer science textbooks? But that was how I how I learned a little about the business. So learn about the business, experiment, and then figure it out. That's my piece of advice. So we're gonna turn it over to the audience in a second, but I, I wanna ask a follow-up to you, Julia, uh -huh. on the basis of, of just those, those remarks. What, what was it like for you as someone who probably didn't take too many economics classes <laughs> at Yale, uh, and who was thinking actually about a, a life of the mind with, with literature, uh, to really take on the business aspects of, of the field to the point where you are now mm. charged with directing a publishing house where right. business, business decision making is the core of what you do every day. Yeah, well, I was really clueless. So I, <laughs> I wanted to talk to professors about books. That's what I thought the job was about. And that naivete was a blessing because then you have to learn what it means to be a salesperson. And this is all a, a, a little, a way of getting at what you're, at, what you're asking me, which is, that, you know, publishing's a business, but it's a business about words. And if you're a word person, as I, as I am, and you love reading and you love ideas, that's glue. That is glue as you're learning what it means to be in business and how to make a living and how to have, you know, in, in the case of Norton, there are 500 people. One of my friends said, oh, you're the president. Now you have 600 mouths to feed. And I'm like, <laughs> thank you. Thank you so much. Yeah. <laughs> but it was, it was that sense of shared purpose with word people trying to reach other readers and idea people that that was, that was the kind of like, okay, I know I'm in the right place and now I just have to learn how you make a business. And that, that's that been 36 years of you know learning how to be in business. And every year we have to reinvent it. Um, and that's that's the challenge, but but I get it. And I've internalized it, it's my world. 
So uh, I'm going to invite <coughs> questions from all of you. And I think the way we're going to do this is that I'm going to ask you to be uh, succinct with the questions so we get as many in as possible. And we'll maybe group two or three uh, and then turn it to the, to the, the two up here for, for answering. So um, I'll, I'll uh, call on you. And then if you could identify yourself before you ask your question. You've talked about books mostly, some journals. What's the genre that you see emerging that you aren't talking about and you don't yet have a pathway for? Mm -hmm. Or you in a scholarship. Thank you. And we'll take at least one, one other one. Yes. Uh, the Lee Sorensen, I'm the art and visual studies librarian here at Duke. Um, the late Philip Roth said that he thought there were only 30,000 serious readers in the United States. <laughs> and I, I don't know if he had any data, but I'd just like to know your opinion on that. Right. <laughs> uh, how many do you think there are? That's a great question. Yeah. Why don't you talk, you want to tackle Liz's question? Sure. The, so it's interesting, Liz, your question, because <clears throat> as I was coming to work today, I was thinking, you know, our books are really. They're multimedia, a number of them. They're, they're image, there are lots of images, but they're you know, books about sound and poetry or books about art, exib you know, art exhibits or different types of art. H how can we figure out a platform that could augment you know, the book? You know, how do, is it manifold? Is, it, is there something out there that's the name of a platform developed by University of Minnesota? But how can we put multimedia or embed that? There's probably not a way from a business perspective to recover that, but how can we make this content come alive in, in ways that are coming alive on your phone, in a way. You know, like, and that sort of speaks into how, how has the, the attention span, you know, all of our attention spans been affected by devices that then prevent you from doing, you know, taking the book before you, you know, and spending time reading. So I, I think there are probably more than 30,000. I saw some figure about um, children are reading more than their parents, so I don't know if that has to do with the Harry Potter type thing. But, um, but you know, I would, I would, I used to always worry at, at when I was at Johns Hopkins that, you know, when you you'd see book sales, kind of print book sales go down, and you were wondering if that was a demographic that was sort of moving off. You didn't know like how what what the reasoning was, um, and and but yeah. I was at, <coughs> I was at a dinner on Monday where that exact. Philip Roth's comment <laughs> was, and we were speculating. It was a bunch of publishers. I'm like, no, and maybe with thirty thousand, it could be more. Um, and we we kind of agreed that there were probably, you know, exponentially more <laughs> than that. But um, it, it's it's not a growing business. It's a it's a very publishing is a very slightly contracting business. So, and serious readers are um, slightly contracting in time, but they're out there. We published um, Richard Powers' book, The Overstory. And, you know, when you start small and then suddenly, well, I mean, that one had the benefit of the Pulitzer Prize, and that's no small thing, but there's word of mouth, and there's a very healthy and it's principally women, but there's an incredibly healthy book group culture that can, that can light a book up and make it have a long life. And then for us, because we are both in the college and the <coughs> trade space, for us we'll sign a book that we sell into the trade and then it'll find its way into f freshman year experience reads um, and then into the curriculum. So the books can have a long tail. How many readers all in, it just depends on how you segment the time, you know, <laughs> it's like 10 years, maybe there's 30 million, but in year one, maybe there are only 30,000. It's like, can you publish books that are going to have a long life? That's the gamble. I mean, the, the, the Nortons, who founded Norton in 1923, we're going to turn 100 pretty soon, um, gave it the motto, books that live. And, you know, we actually try to think about it. Are we publishing something for the long haul? Uh, maybe. I'm a staff member at Nicholas Institute, but my ever since I was a kid, and creating my own books, publishing has been at my heart. I'm currently in the Master's in Library and Information Science program, um, and a lot of the talk in our program is about big publishing houses and university presses 
kind of going to battle with libraries and battling for tenancies, the tenancies and people buying books versus borrowing them from libraries. I'm wondering if you could talk about that a little bit. Yeah. Okay. We would take one more before we. Yes. Uh, I'm an undergraduate uh, in the literature program. Um, you talked a lot about expanding the access to books via distribution channels, but I wanted to ask about um, whether you think, specifically in the academic press world, that the text itself might need to become more accessible. So, like, what potential advantages or disadvantages do you see in like shifting the style of humanities books from a more traditionally academic style to maybe a more engaging literary nonfiction style that might appeal to more readers? So the two questions about access. So the I, I love you know one of the things I'm actively trying to dispel is that libraries and presses are more similar than than different. Um, we're both we're all we're in the same boat. We're trying to do the same thing. So you have knowledge acquisition, creation, and discovery going on with presses and libraries together. So I, I view that as something like my partnerships in the future will involve the Duke Library and other libraries because I don't see a big difference. But I, a difference. But I will say there's a percentage of the public, every publishing staff that's wary of libraries and a percentage of every library staff that's wary of publishers. So and that, that again, I'm, I'm trying to change those things because I think that there's a there's a natural synergy there of what we're trying to accomplish on on the on, you know you know in terms of bringing knowledge to the world. I definitely I definitely agree with that. The um, so one of the things getting back slightly to that other question is audio is something we haven't figured out yet. And I'd really like what would it would it be great if you had? I'm trying to figure out like what test can I do? What book is written in a way that wouldn't be dense theory that you could do an audio book that you know somebody would enjoy while doing something else and trying to think about that. I went to Flyleaf last Saturday night with my daughter and I said, um, this is the bibliotherapy portion of the talk, but <laughs> I, the person behind the counter, I said, what, am I, what do I need to read? And that person immediately took me to In the Dream House and said, I read this cover to cover. Mm -hmm. Now that's a new format, that's a new style of writing that style of writing actually is almost quasi-academic. And when you open the first page, you see they reference a Duke author, and then they also, at the end, reference a Duke book. So somehow those lines are starting to blur, and that's a really, for me, a really exciting thing. Uh, I think the question about the uh, tension between the commercial publishers, the Big Five and the libraries, is, is uh, located in John Sargent's open letter to the library about basically about access to ebooks and the number of uses that a library can have of an ebook that is purchased from a commercial house. And the issue there is, and you know it as well as I, it's 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 the price. It's the can you find a price where the publisher is seeing some return. It's not an indefinite, you know, borrowing of a book with no compensation to the publisher. I do not know how this is going to, it's been a long fight and I don't know how it gets resolved because it is about price. I always tend to think if you have two poles somewhere in the middle, you can find a place to agree on what's fair and, and there's, there can be a win-win, but we're not there yet with that. And with respect to the style of academic um, books, uh, I, in, you know, the, the evaluations that we make when a proposal comes in that is by someone, with, you know, by an academic, is whether or not its, its style is accessible to a general reader, but also that the topic is sufficiently broad to reach a wider swath of those 30,000 people. And that, <clears throat> those are the criteria for considering it just out of the gate. If it is, a, an accessible style. I mean, narrative, narrative is an art, and I hope that we are living in an era where narrative is is considered um, part of a graduate training, you know, a value for graduates. Uh, you can write a clear, accessible narrative that is substantive. Um, but there's, there's that moment where we will say, this really doesn't belong with us. This belongs with a university press. 
It's a great topic, interestingly executed, but not right for Norton. So that's, that's where we kind of draw the line. Just a little bit of context. If there are only 30,000 <laughs> serious readers, that's one in a thousand in the country. <laughs> seems low. It seems low. <laughs> I agree, it seems low. Other questions? Mm -hmm. Yes. Hi, my name is Tony Portis, and I'm a PhD student here with uh, Duke English. And I was just curious, uh, coming from an <coughs> academic institution, man, um, what do you see for those academics that do try and go, go into the trade realm? Oh, what strengths do they bring? What do you like? That, that, what do they do well? And where are they challenged, if, if not just the academic yes. writing style? Yeah, no, that's that's right. That's right in the place of the tension, and the strengths that for our list, Academic Spring, are two things I've mentioned. One is, I mean, we want to publish lasting, distinguished books. And that is often the work of academics who, are, who do that kind of research. It's about a deeply researched, um, thoughtful narrative and, a, and an interesting argument. So there, that's, that's what we look for. We publish that kind of book if we see sufficient opportunity both in the near-term trade mar uh, market and then, as a, I, I've said, in the long-term college market as well. So it's that kind of trifecta of concerns that we're constantly evaluating. But we are a house where um, <coughs> we, you know, we have extremely distinguished lists in, in history and political science and serious nonfiction. That's, that's one of our stock in trade. I mean, the only thing I'll say there too is there's no, there's no harm in starting with the university press and then going to the trade for the second or third book because my colleagues, some of my colleagues would always be sad when we'd lose authors and I said, no, that's part of what we're here for. Like, that, this is, you know, if, if they start with the university press and the next time they end up in Norton, then we've done our job well. You know, that's, that is going to be a better experience for everybody involved. And it would likely be the case that the university press is going to be more willing to take a, a chance on a first time author. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Uh, Dustin Bank, I'm a fifth year doctoral candidate in theology. Um, on that note, can you provide any advi advice for folks like myself who are beginning to think about our first book um, and the range of decisions you might have to make, whether that's um, finding an agent, developing a proposal, who to pitch it to, and the timing in which to do that? Now you should hit this one. <laughs> Foreground the argument. Foreground the argument. That's good advice. Um, in the, inter the introduction is key in that proposal. Like you really want to make sure that's well done. Workshop that. Have somebody have a mentor look at that. Because the one thing I see that the most, you know, from the, the, the manuscripts we look at is that the introduction is trying to uh, address all of the peer review comments at once. And so do that and then trash that and then redo that. Um, so, I mean, I think it even, it, it, it happened to me too. So the proposal, you want a sense, you want an introduction or a sample chapter, you want uh, what the book is, what it's about, what, what, you know, where does it fit within the canon of what you're trying to do, um, market potential, you want to, and even something that's changed is, What's the sense of platform? Are you on Twitter? Do you have uh, any sense of, because even we do look at those things and we evaluate that as well. Um, you know, we had a big a book that we were quote unquote calling a trade book at Cornell, but the person that wrote it didn't have, was just, it was in Canada. It was about our election system. And it was, we ended up doing it, but there were serious sort of questions about how, how, how we're gonna make this book work. Mm -hmm. So, um, I think, yeah, I mean, yeah. No, I, I think Dean is exactly right about the practical and the, and the strategic move of foregrounding the argument, but the practical ex execution of a proposal with respect to agents. I mean, I, I know a very, uh, I don't think the, U, the university press world requires an agent. We don't require an agent, um, but it is much, much more the norm that uh, projects come to us from agents, but I don't, I think that, I think the doors open. I don't, you do like, uh, want inquiries? Just not the whole proposal, but an inquiry? Yeah, 
I mean, it can't hurt to reach out to an editor in that discipline, Sandra Korn or Stella Fasado or Courtney Berger, to just get a sense because they're, they're they'd be willing to help you. Even you know that's part of the thing we do is that we'll we'll help really if somebody has a project. We won't, we're here as a resource to try and provide advice too. Good for us, or maybe that that's a blank press book. We think. Right. Exactly. Maybe time for one last question. Mm -hmm. Ashton Merck, I'm a six-year doctoral candidate in history. Um, I just had a question about distribution channels. If you can talk about that again. Mm -hmm. I was surprised when I heard that indie bookstores were 10%. Yeah. Um, I'd be curious for like the long graph of that. Like, is that going up? Is that sort of been constant? Right. Time? That's a great question. It's a really interesting area to to um, take a look at the just the last 15 years. Let's say the indies were. They, they took a big hit. A lot of them went under when uh, BNN and Borders were in the ascendant. Um, Amazon has taken down more, but, and this, uh, my uh, colleague just came back from one of the re uh, regional meetings. What's happening now is the strong ones are thriving. A lot of them are reinventing themselves in ways that are really quite uh, uh, diversifying. I, I went to um, one of the Indies in Denver and the owner had introduced a coffee bar, a wine bar, a reading group room, a, um, a book group, yeah, the, the reading group room, and a book-themed Airbnb that, <laughs> that authors couldn't, but she had sufficiently diversified and become such a neighborhood hub that it was just like a, a beacon. And what's happening in the indie world is that a whole new generation of younger booksellers are opening up new shops or taking over from you know their retiring uh, uh, predecessors. So I think there's so much vitality in that indie channel. But so the so the shrinking, I think it went down into double digits. It's now up to around 10 or 11. That's the right direction. But it's such a we support your indie bookstore. I know you got. I know this is a place where they are thriving. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, what, one more, one very quick last question. Very quickly, on behalf of the communicators in the room who often are uh, in a position of trying to help faculty get the word out about their books, are there any particular tips that you as publishers would give to us in helping faculty to um, create buzz around their books? So, depending on where they went to school, contact the alumni magazine at that school. That's one of the things that help them develop a Twitter presence. I'm one who believes that authors should take a role in marketing their books and so help them. And the person that you need to talk to is right behind yeah. you, Laura. Laura knows a lot about all of this and I think, but, but you know, there's probably a toolkit that we could provide and, and send me an email and we could help, help you with that. I think the woman sitting uh, to the right of you actually has great, uh, good ideas about this too. Allison, Allison comes up to New York and talks about Duke authors and um, fosters those kinds of connections. And I know that's, a, that's something that Duke um, is committed to supporting. Well. well, I hope you'll agree with me that uh, at least in some quarters, uh, the, uh, the, the world of book publishing is vital and strong. And, uh, and thank, uh, thank me, uh, thank, uh, our, our <laughs> thank you, Ed. Uh, thank you. Thank our, yeah, thank thank our panelists <laughs> uh, for a fantastic uh, hours. <laughs>